This is Sound Notion, the podcast for new music and music news. I'm Sam Mercier's. I'm David McDonald. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Nate Blyton. And joining us this week on the podcast are two members of the New York-based new music ensemble, Cadillac Moon Ensemble, Patty Kilroy and Roberta Michelle. Thanks so much for joining us this morning, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So we were uh, teased some of our audience uh, probably over a month ago or more than a, over a month ago uh, by saying we were going to have you guys on before, but the creeping croup had gotten a hold of a couple of you, so we had to reschedule. So finally, here you are. Um, so you guys have a new album uh, that came out fairly recently, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, before that, I was wondering if you could just tell us about how you guys got together. The The ensemble is flute, Roberta, your flute player, and Patty is violin, and then you have cello and percussion, which is not the most standard thing that we're used to hearing in Western art music, so uh, why don't you tell us about how you guys got together? Um, well, we formed as a student ensemble at Purchase College, and um, we were originally a Piero um, set up, so we had clarinet and piano as well, and then circumstances led to... Um, us no longer have clarinet or piano, and then we like the sound of the four instruments together. So we stuck together, and over the years, um, some of the players have changed. So Patty um, joined in a few years ago now, Don and Megan a little more recently. Nice. Um, so uh, on your website, it says that you guys have commissioned and premiered over 50 works. So obviously this is something that's really important to you. Was this something that you, you looked at doing from the very beginning that you wanted to accomplish from the very beginning, or did you just start off playing rep pieces and trying to get gigs? Well, at the very beginning we had, there were like two or three pieces that were written for our instrumentation. And then we played a lot of things like cage and other um, pieces for indeterminate instrumentation and from there, we really had to build if we wanted to keep on playing. So we, we started commissioning right from the beginning. And it's now, I think, up to over 70 pieces. I think this, wow. that's, in a lot of ways, that's kind of a new model for uh, new music ensembles is to just put together an ensemble with whoever you like playing with and then commission new works because you're kind of cornered into playing new rep and, and being really active in commissioning through the, uh, the, the, the limited history of your instrumentation, which is, a, I think, a really cool model. It used to be, you know, you, you, if you were a violinist and you wanted to play chamber music, then you need to find another violinist and a violist and a cellist, and then you'd start <laughs> a string quartet, and you'd have, you know, 300, 400 years of, of repertoire that you could take from. But now you can just, if, you're, if you want to focus on new music, just grab whoever you like playing with and solve that, <laughs> that rep problem later. That's kind of exciting. And- uh, commission to, I, I don't know if this is a commission, but you guys do a, a Danny Felsenfeld piece, Something yeah. Wicked. We Was did. that commissioned? Uh, yeah, we for an 80s, I think, right, Patty? Um, in the last spring, right? Is yeah. When we did it? yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't even realize that Danny is a multiple appearance friend of the show. Um, we've had him on quite a few times. And uh, so I'm just trying to, I'm just looking through the list. This is a lot of composers. And as composers, all of us are composers. So when we look at this list, it's it's a very good thing to see. Yeah. Um, so uh, are all the pieces, uh, you have a new album. that. Came, when did the new album come out? It was released in September 2012. So it's actually, it's not oh, quite okay. so new anymore. But. Uh, okay. Well, anyway. Uh, it's still, uh, uh, you know, the newest thing you have out. And I was listening to it this morning and commenting to the, the rest of the panel that when you look at your instrumentation, you expect, and, and not that this is necessarily a bad thing, but you expect this kind of uh, minimalist sounding ostinato kind of propulsion based music. And there's a lot of that out there right now. But this, uh, at least a lot of it, sounds like you're more, you know, angst-ridden, hand-wringing Western art music, which I'm actually a big fan of. Um, were all the pieces on this uh, album commissioned specifically for the release? 
Um, no, they were um, sort of the best of commissions that we've done over the past few years. So all of the pieces, except Sean Allison's piece, which he wrote for 8th Blackbird, um, were commissions for us. Um, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Okay, cool. So um, in addition to just, I mean, kind of playing with the people that you like, do you find that the violin, cello, percussion, and flute ensemble lends some different musical choices that you can that you can have or like uh i mean it's a different kind of texture than the pearl ensemble and i uh, <laughs> and obviously the string quartet um do you, do you, yeah are there things are there that you find that you can do musically with this group or that you found in the pieces that people write that you haven't found playing in other chamber groups or anything I'm actually always surprised at how flexible the instrumentation is. I mean, the the percussion part of the group can like really be anything. I mean, Sean Sean plays vibraphone in a lot of our pieces, and a lot of the more European influenced pieces tend to. I, I don't know. I feel like they tend to have like things like vibraphone or or like higher things. But I mean, and then there are a lot of pieces where we play drum set where it sounds like a lot more. Yeah, right. uh, accessible, but I, it's actually very flexible. Um, there was one comment that one composer had made about our instrumentation when he was writing for us. His name is Tim Hansen, and he was he was talking about how there were a lot of hides, like a lot of high high ranges in our instrumentation. I mean, between flute and violin, and I mean, cello can go pretty high too, but cello is really yeah, that's yeah. The, it's the low yeah. low end person um but it's funny because he made this whole piece for us about flea circuses <laughs> um, <laughs> it was for a, for a set of questions about dark circuses <laughs> but i but i think i mean i, I don't know why I, I think he, he he really did think that that the the average pitch was on the high side but i i, I still think that that's not really a a, a factor that makes us at least aesthetically inflexible you know it's just mm -hmm. kind of like a range thing Absolutely. yeah so one of the problems that I think a lot of composers have when they write for our instrumentation is how to best combine flute and violin because I think we're two where we basically have similar ranges but we have very different timbres so I think that's that's been one of the trickier things that composers navigate, and they do it in some really interesting ways, like combining our colors. I think. Interesting. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, the the challenge to me would be um, dynamic control, because <laughs> um, flute. We've had this discussion with other flutists on the show that flute to make a noise on a flute, there's a certain threshold you have to cross because you're blowing air across this hole, you know, and you just can't play as soft as certainly a percussionist. The percussion can play softer than anybody, and strings, I mean, they can touch very, 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 very lightly, and so that, my biggest concern would be balance in that way. Um, do you list harmony instruments that composers can write for you guys, uh, for flute? Do we do we list harmony instruments? I, don't know I mean, do, do you do you do you use alto and bass flute oh, or yeah, anything yeah. like that? On so I play bass through piccolo. I don't have a contra bass flute yet, but <laughs> that's on my list. I don't know if I've ever seen. It's one. only what fourteen thousand dollars or something, probably. And a taxi ride everywhere you want to go. Right. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So um, I was trying to read about this so I could introduce it, but I, I don't think there's any way I could do it justice. So I'm just going to ask you guys to tell me about this thing. Coming up in uh, on December 20th, <laughs> you have it. <laughs> so this is, this is a thing, obviously. The Den of Death. Uh, I'm not even going to start to read about it. Tell us about the Den of Death. Patty, do you want to talk about it? <laughs> just giggling. Uh, um. Okay. You know it's so, got to be good. <laughs> so, Den of Death is basically um, our reaction to um, some very strange program notes we got one, one year. And um, he had quoted, he had quoted um, proverbs about um, 
I don't remember what what the the verse was exactly, but but the the words were, and it was from like a really like. Um, anyway, it, he 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 quoted proverbs, and it was um it was the the quote was um for she wait. But she has been the ruin Thank of you. many, many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to Sheol. Her bedroom is the den of death. <laughs> wow. Yeah, describing, describing ladies. So I was, yeah. so, so we were all like, that's, that's weird. And then um, in this concert, we kind of, in this set of commissions, we told composers, okay, well, uh, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we came up with very, very different things. So we kind of had to blow up the topic a lot, like past that. Um, we have a piece about, um, <clears throat> um, we have a piece from um, Alex Temple that's going to be a science fiction micro opera mm. about, um, <laughs> set in a world where um, where people are divided by left-handedness or right-handedness, and there is a left-handed person that decides to switch to become a right-handed person yeah actually she's born right-handed and identifies Dang it. Left-handed. <laughs> that's what i mean yeah you can't tell the difference um, i love it that the introduction of this piece is like in a world that's, that's that that sh- it, should, it should start out that way in a world where left-handed and right-handed people yes so i i also could say that i, I love the the phrase um, wh- wh- sci-fi micro opera is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. a pretty great phrase that needs to be used a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we're really excited about that piece. It's great. And um, our cellist is singing the protagonist role, so she is she is the right-handed person <laughs> <coughs> meant to be left-handed, and she cre- creates a sort of free state utopia that gets crushed by by the right-handed. Now masses. is <laughs> is she also playing the cello? Yes. Oh wow, that's very cool. Are the rest of you singing? Sometimes. <laughs> Patty and not, I. Kind of. Not as not as complicated stuff though. <laughs> <laughs> Is she singing and playing cello simultaneously? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she does a lot wow. of singer songwriter stuff with her cello, where she she sings a lot of songs and um, plays. So this is sort of something she's pretty used to doing. Yeah. yeah, that's very cool, and, yeah. and not as easy as a lot of classically trained people might think. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Not, not easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I was reading about some uh, some of your bios on on the website, and I I saw that Megan had a certain background in composition and improvisation. I was wondering how much that worked its way into your group. Uh, do you do you write for each other and, and improvise as a group or anything too, or? Um, our, our original cello, or our original violinist wrote a piece for us years ago, but since then we haven't, we haven't composed for the group yet at all. <laughs> I think Sean, Sean writes some, right? And yeah, he hasn't in a while. I mean, I, I don't know. It's, I, composition is hard. I'm sure that you all know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like we have well, composers writing for us that, I, I don't know. I wouldn't feel comfortable Are, putting my pieces with. Yeah, they're all much, they're that's, all much that's, better than I, I am at that's composing. That's quite a know? fair point. And you're busy <laughs> being amazing performers and stuff, so you've got <laughs> got enough on your plate, I imagine. <laughs> we do improvise a bit, though. There's there's another piece on the Den of Death concert, Meow Remix, um, <laughs> <laughs> which which <laughs> we're so excited about because Patty and I are both super obsessed Dog with cats, cats, and Patty's r- ridiculously obsessed with the internet. And so Meow Remix takes um, takes internet cat memes. So it takes like Meow Cat and Meow Mix and memory keyboard from cat. cat. And oh yeah, keyboard cat and so it mashes them all together. Mm-hmm. We do a lot of improvising on, on those things. I can add me a new music ensemble. <laughs> um, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And that makes me... Uh, uh, reminds me of I accidentally put, and I don't know if you got my email this morning, but the cat video I put in the dot for the show was an accident. I was trying to put that on my <laughs> wife's Facebook wall, um, but I'm glad you saying. enjoyed it. <laughs> so for keyboard cat, are you actually like doing the Casio keyboard or whatever no, it is? To, to that def- would be nice. <laughs> okay. um, I, I know that 
that Megan is playing like the bass line sometimes. Um, <laughs> it's actually it's actually not as direct a reference to Keyboard Cat as I I would have. <laughs> That's okay. You should That's show okay. the video. <laughs> Yeah, the most obvious one is the Nyan Cat. Yeah, the Nyan Cat one happens all the time. <laughs> yes. So other events you guys have coming up, uh, you're going to be at, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sure the schedule will fill out more as you move into the new year, but it seems like you're constantly doing new works and doing uh, student works at one location, which as a former student composer, I am immensely thankful for. Uh, doing a residency at Mansfield University where you'll play works by a faculty member. Uh, uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth where you do student works alongside some of the stuff from your rep. Um, and the, uh, a cool thing, well, and then uh, in residence at SUNY, the SUNY Graduate Center doing... The SUNY, uh, SUNY Graduate I, Center. Su excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a confusion. It's the City University. Yeah, S-U-N-Y or S-U-N-Y. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Makes sense. ah, gotcha. And are these student, like graduate student works that you're doing? Yeah, so I actually went to the Graduate Center, and it's um, all doctoral students there. So they're all with nice. One of them has written a piece for us before that's on our album, Andre Richager. So he's one of the students writing for us. So we'll get another piece from him. And um, yeah, several other, I think it's seven students. Am I right? Crigliano teaches there. Oh, yeah, he does. Yeah, that's right. He's, so I, are you ever I, in I collaboration with him? Much, no, I, I actually never saw him there <laughs> when I was. <laughs> Yeah, when when somebody like him teaches somewhere, that means he's on the web page and he shows up occasionally. But <laughs> well, I think he teaches, but people take lessons with him and they go go to him. <laughs> yeah, he's a busy guy. He's a busy guy. Now, one thing that sounds really cool that Patrick actually needs because Patrick lives in New York, uh, and Patrick, you need to look into this. And if I were in New York, I would look into it. The Cadillac Dinner Ensemble. Uh, <laughs> Where you're going to be doing a concert and cooking a meal for people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're really excited about this. So we're all super obsessed with food. Um, Sean, who's also Patty, he's a percussionist, but also Patty's uh, fiance, is um, really into gastronomy and molecular cooking stuff. And he and I sort of have cooking competitions via text message pictures a lot. <laughs> nice. so we're all pretty into cooking and we thought we'd combine it and cook a several course dinner while we play some works along the way. Wait, so you're going to, you're going to perform while you're actually cooking. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, we're going to have, <laughs> no. we're like, that sounds like, the kitchen and some people playing. So we're okay. we'll do some smaller. I was going to say, that sounds kind of dangerous. Oven, we can play a piece and we need to figure out the exact logistics, but it will be, it'll be tasty. Yeah. I was going to say, like, playing flute while singing and cooking an omelet all at the same time. That'd be pretty intense. <laughs> that sounds like, yeah. What a, um, what a one so, you, so you haven't quite figured out how, how you're going to do that yet? Is that what you said? Well, I think we haven't figured out the menu, so it depends on, you know, how intensive the cooking there while we're there and how much prep. Where, where do you do something like that? What? Where do you do something like that? This um, is a really I, interesting I, idea. I have a 2,000 square foot loft, um, so it's, it's perfect for like house concerts. And it, it was designed originally for a dinner theater um, who sort of lived here and performed. So um, we have a huge kitchen with um, it, it with more dishes than you could ever ask for. <laughs> Very nice. nice. You should have themed dishes like uh, dodecaphonic pasta. It has 12 ingredients in it. <laughs> That is the worst uh, joke I've a, ever heard. Oh, shut up. Being a foodie, I think, <laughs> plays right into the idea of being a music theory nerd. Because <laughs> if you're a foodie who's into, like, uh, micro gastronomy or something like that, it's kind of a nerdy thing, like, in the same way that music theory can be a very nerdy thing. I mean, you could get a lot of music, get a lot of music out of the world of cereal as well. Uh, right. <laughs> we are going downhill fast, <laughs> and that's Patrick that's uh, that's us. the turning point of the show. Yeah, 
we're done. So do you guys have any uh, pending commissions uh, coming up for big works or anything like that? Um, yeah, we just got a J Fund commission um, for Conrad Winslow, who's written us a piece before, but he's going to be writing a 25-minute work um, for us next fall. And we've actually, we're commissioning Sean Allison again to write for us. And um, Andy Stirk marcel is writing us a piece for the spring. And I'm, I'm forgetting some, Patty. Help. <laughs> Andy's doing it. We're going to play. I mean, that's not a commission, but we're playing a piece by Randy Wolf. And um, no, I got nothing. <laughs> we've, been, we've been talking with uh, Lainey Pfefferman and... Oh, yeah, yeah. Trying to figure out timings and things like that. Well, it just seems like you're doing this commissioning uh, new works and premiering new works nonstop. Um, and we really appreciate that. Um, do you ever, uh, I, I'm curious, if you're commissioning that much, do you ever worry that you're, like, leaving this old rep behind, that, that like, you, you spent all this time getting this, this new thing together, and then you, you play it a little bit, and then you move on to the next thing? Is there, do you, do you ever think about, um, you know, trying to keep these, these new works in the, in the scene, so to speak? Well, what we've been doing, um, with our commissions lately is we've been commissioning them in sets so that logistically instrumentation wise, they're, um, they're easy to like they're easy they're very compatible like often like there will often be a lot of like percussion overlap between them and um thematically they work together so we've been kind of trying to put together these i don't know i guess the like a good word would be packages it sounds sort of um <laughs> That's a little sort marky, of, but <laughs> yeah yeah but um so we have like a like a, a theme uh, of a set of commissions set around like the theme of motion and movement that we did after the Atlas set that we recorded. And now we, we're going to have this Den of Death one. We have the Dark Circus set. So, I mean... And we end up are, playing a lot of the pieces. Like, we've played most of the pieces in our rep at least four or five times. Which yeah. Is, it's unusual for a lot of music. Yes. But ideally, we'll play yeah. those those sets of pieces more than more than once like i mean i feel like they would be very convenient to bring to like student venue like like venues where we'd be presenting to a lot of students or, or something like that i mean because there's a, there's definitely like um a very like there are a lot of very like tangible talking points that we've already developed with those those programs so yeah. that's always nice no that's um, cool so we've tried to make it easy for ourselves in that way. Yeah, and I think for a while we were just trying to create a repertoire that we could have a little variety and choose from. So we were just in a like commission flurry that yeah. got got a little crazy. Patty, yeah. Patty, would you mind restarting your video? Your your video has stopped for us. Oh no. That's all right. You look you look a lot younger. I do. I'm like <laughs> I'm like 18 in that photo. Um. <laughs> So no, that's that's very cool, and I'm I'm wondering now that you've commissioned this this repertoire for this relatively uh, unusual instrumentation, do you know if, if, has anyone else taken any of these works and performed them separately? Are there any other groups that you are sharing rep with? Yeah, I've seen a couple other groups perform. Um, I actually just got an email from Rick Burkhart, one of our composers, um, asking for the score to the piece that he wrote for us, which I, I think he couldn't find on his computer. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, good. When I get Europe, when I deploy Remember, it. kids, um, back up. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it was the paper. I think he was just away oh. from home, and his oh, okay. yeah, that that particular score is on paper. That's um, crazy. But but yeah, it's it, there. People are starting to play play these pieces some other some other places, which is really cool. Yeah, very nice. So you guys perform in a variety of different types of venues, from probably, you know, music school auditoriums to museums to uh, like clubs. So do you have certain kind of groups of rep that you know will work better in in you know the more sedate kind of museum setting versus playing at a club setting where people are going to be up getting drinks and what have you. 
Um, I, usually when we play at like a bar or sort of more restaurant club type setting, it's usually in the context of a concert anyway. So um, it's, it's usually still people are pretty attentive um, and, and listening. Right. Um, so there isn't that much like getting up, getting drinks, um, or if there is, it's like, will be amplified. So it's, it's okay. You can hear it anyway. Um, but I, I don't think we've, we've tried to, to program as much per venue. Mm. Well, that actually brings up my next question has, uh, you said that you've been amplified, but that's just to make you more audible. Has anyone written you a piece where amplification was like written into the score? Because that's the other thing that I think immediately when I hear about this ensemble, because I'm like, I like amplification. <laughs> and, uh, and it would be, I think, pretty easy to do. So we have uh, actually one of the Den of Death pieces, Kamikaze Karaoke, um, <laughs> yeah. that we're playing. It's written by Matt Marks. And he sort of originally wanted it to be all amplified, but we're, we're trying to, we try and get a little more level so we venues that don't necessarily require amplification, but we're playing with um, Hatsumi Miku, who is this, um, have, have you guys heard of Hatsumi Miku? I can't no. say that I have. So she's this, um, or she, she's a computer program that you can, you can purchase, you can buy her voice uh, um, and, and make her sing. Huh. Her song. So then it, and, and it, it, she's huge in Japan. There are like thousands of people that come to her concerts, and they they post a hologram of her, and it's kind of insane. <laughs> but, um, Wait, what's uh, Hatsune, what's the name? Hatsune H A T S U N E Miku M I K U, and it, it's like super cool. So Mad Mark set um, a bunch of songs, and we're accompanying her. So she's she's all in the flat. She's just um, oh, I think Patty's having some problems with Wi-Fi, uh -oh. and then we're um, we're accompanying her and playing a cool. Hatsune Miku is a humanoid persona. Yeah, <laughs> voiced by a singing oh. synthesizer. It's really funny in our rehearsals. We start referring to her and we're talking about her, and yeah. it feels like she's another person there in the room. <laughs> <laughs> that is that's that's the kind of nerdy thing that everybody's in because as soon as you said that i bet everybody on the panel was like oh i gotta look that up yeah <laughs> I, just, I just wrote it down there's, I mean, a, there's an interview with matt marks on our blog that that goes into a lot of detail about hatsune <laughs> Miku. check that out well yeah. well that's a way to to do something that is i think intrinsically cool but it has some some cultural connections that might interest uh, some people and widen your audience a little bit because there's got to be people if they're big fans of this persona, mm -hmm. then then you know that's like getting uh, you know a star to sing on your album. You know, it's going to draw people in that might not have otherwise been interested. Yeah. <laughs> that is really cool. Uh oh, Patty's hey, getting the, the wheel of death on her computer. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh oh! <laughs> oh no! Well, if 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 she gets if she gets back in, let me know and I'll I'll call her back. Okay. Um. All right. <laughs> Bummer. The wonders of technology, as as we always say, Skype is a delicate flower. Mm -hmm. Uh so This this very cool. I had never heard of. Uh, Hatsune Niku before. Is that something you can generate live or is it something that you like pre-program and render ahead of time? It's something that you pre-program. So it's uh, uh, basically like coming up with a tape part. I, I'm not sure. If, uh, I imagine you could do something live um, or, or pretty quickly you could type it in because you type in the notes you want her to sing and you can change the quality of her voice, how male or female Hatsune Niku is or how, how low or high it's Pretty crazy. <laughs> that is really cool. I'm going to look into playing with that. Yeah, a really interesting collaboration to be <laughs> working with a piece of software. Right. <laughs> Such a persona. Yeah. It was interesting that you, you commented on it, but right away when you started talking about this, you were saying her. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, and she, and I was confused a little bit. And I'm like, what's going on here? Anyway, that's really cool. 
you, so you moving on to the is she if you like look at a youtube video of her singing because there is she's this giant like <laughs> couple story tall hologram that's displayed <laughs> it's crazy. wild that's cool. really cool yeah <sighs> anybody surprised that, that that japanese people came up with that no Just not one bit was that a racist joke because no, i was feeling it's, that's it's what our show about... was missing this morning it's talking about how awesome Japanese people are. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> moving on to moving on to the news. We got some Grammys. Well, the not Grammys, we, but Grammys? somebody got some 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 yeah, Grammy nominations, no. right? They don't they don't get, they don't get them yet. Well, they're just nominations. But there's some really interesting people nominated, including, um, you know, a lot of new music in the, the kind of gener- general classical music categories, which I think is, is pretty cool. There's uh, in the, just in the best orchestral performance stuff, there's some, some early 20th century stuff. No living composers there, but we have uh, Kurt Atterberg and Ludislavski and Sibelius and Stravinsky. There are two living opera composers in the best opera recording nominations. Of the five best opera recording nominations, two of them are by living composers, which is pretty cool. Uh, Uh, Patty's back on, by the way, if you want. Okay, I'll I'll get her. Going in for the news. (laughs) Um, And uh, there's some some other cool stuff in there. uh, The uh, Roomful of Teeth recording that Carolyn Shaw, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner this year, was on. Uh, was nominated for Best Chamber m- Music Recording and for uh, the Best Classical Composition. Also, Maria Schneider in Best Classical Composition in her collaboration with Don Upshaw. How cool was that? Did you have anything else you wanted to you pull out of there, Sam? No, you you uh, stole my thunder completely there. Because uh, I'm a jerk. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, well, what are you gonna do, Patrick? Did you have um, you had a chance to look at all of these things? Uh, I have. Um, it's been a few days since I looked at them. Though I do know that um, that uh, Magnus Lindberg was nominated twice, I believe for P for 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 the work itself and for the recording, uh, piano concerto number no. two. There's some Britain on there. There's also Stravinsky and a uh, I think a Rite of Spring recording i think as well um yeah so yeah so you know in it's case you thought that we in. were missing uh, we were missing out on some some right of spring recordings with you know simon <laughs> right. rattle right it's hard to find a recording of that piece. i know right especially this year it's been the, I've, i yeah. haven't heard anything about the right of spring all 2013 <laughs> yeah yeah not one bit. We should just list the pieces that are up for best contemporary classical composition, which, um, I, as a side note, it's funny that when you go to the Grammys site, they have a category called composition, but it has nothing to do with what I'm about to say, which is, it's like, who wrote this jazz piece that was on this album by, you know. Well, it's all in the classical category, Sam. They don't, you can't overlap your, you can't cross the streams. That's right. Uh, the best classical <laughs> compositions were uh, Magnus Lindbergh. Magnus Lindbergh, Piano Concerto Number no. Two, Arvo Pert, Adam's Lament, Esopekka Solonen Violin Concerto, which I actually heard the other day. And I'm not the biggest Esopekka Solonen fan generally, but I really liked that piece. The Violin Concerto is really <laughs> awesome. I saw it. I saw her. Um, what's her? I forgot who what her name is, but I saw her play it. It was uh, Leila Josephowitz, right? That's Leila it. Josephowitz. <laughs> yeah. She no, she's so time. good. She is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that might have been. I mean, I found it. I found it on YouTube, so I don't know who it was. Sure How did you feel her. about the the crazy, crazy drum con- uh, the like the drum solo like in the in the one of the middle movements? It was. I don't know. That's like my favorite part. I like heard that part in like dress rehearsal and totally freaked out. I went up to the drummer afterward. I was like, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this I think really, I feel I more violin it. concertos should have a big drum solo in the middle. <laughs> that is what this repertoire has been missing all these 300 years. True. Well, you know, <laughs> writing a violin concerto is, is, is its own kind of big deal because yeah. you've got such a huge thing hanging off of you when you think, I'm going to write a violin concerto. Right. There's only been 5,000 violin concertos. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> like right up there with saying, you know what I'm going to write today? A symphony. Like, you, you got your symphonies, your violin concertos, and, you know, maybe a 
piano sonata or something nice. is up in that that's range. That's definitely a one day project. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's not a big deal. It's like a we- a long weekend maybe. You know. Yeah. So I think the, the violin concerto actually I I'm I'm ready for it to have a, like a big resurgence because I think. People are finally over. Certainly, a concerto needs to show. I mean, for new ones, a concerto needs to show that the player can really play. But I think we're finally over having pieces that don't do much more than just showing how good the violin player can play. Um, and I think this the Solomon piece does that. I don't think it's gone forever. Okay. No, it's not gone forever. Moving there, on. There are violin. There are violin concertos on the way. Right. Actually, have you guys ever considered uh, commissioning a concerto for Cadillac Moon Ensemble? Uh, that actually sounds pretty appealing to me. Yeah, I think if we could get an orchestra interested, yeah, it yeah, I, I think that's expensive. the big problem, logistical yeah. problem there. I think we could get a lot of composers interested, but... Finding well, enough orchestras sure. willing to no, do it. That's, 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 that's complicated. Just say to the composer, listen, we're commissioning you. Done. Yeah, find <laughs> an orchestra. Yeah. Awesome. You, you, you got you to gotta play the game and just, just like put it together. And, be, and then you walk up to some, some orchestra. Oh, yeah. Didn't you know you were playing this with us? <laughs> <laughs> we'll yeah. keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, that always yeah. works. You know, Patty, you can I, be in charge I, of that. I, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've always thought that if you put a condition in the commission, like this needs to be playable by a pretty good collegiate uh, orchestra. And so make that one of the things the composer has to think about, you know, so you don't <laughs> have to get your hands on the New York Philharmonic in order to pull it off. That would be a lot easier. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, one of the cool things about composing it from the beginning is you establish what your boundaries are. And if you know that that's one of your boundaries, I don't have any problem with writing that way. You know what orchestra is probably not going to play your concerto for Cadillac Moon Ensemble right. is the Minnesota Orchestra. Because yeah. they're not playing anything right now. <laughs> they haven't played anything oh, for over a year, almost a year and a half now. And they just had their annual meeting this week, which they're still having... I guess, yes. the, the Minnesota Orchestra Association. And they decided that what they really wanted to do is reelect all the people that have driven their entire institution into the ground over the last couple of years. Uh, so, and, and this was after, I believe, like a dozen state senators or something yeah. had said that they should get rid of those two, two higher ups. Yeah. Well, you know, senators are always right. Right. Yes. Well, these are state senators, so they're like part timers. So they're more right probably than the full timers that work in Washington. But yeah, I mean, so they 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 reelected uh, the president Michael Henson uh, and the the board chair John Campbell and the and the past board chair Richard Davis are still still all around. They they talked about their expenses. They still, despite uh, having no concerts, they still had thirteen million dollars in expenses, including. $885,000 on, <clears throat> quote, costs related to the negotiations. And I got to tell you, they overpaid on that uh, 80, 80, 80, 885000 I, I would have gotten nothing accomplished for them for at least half that. Half that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I think they're, they're – it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, they They – T- their fiscal year of 2013 ended August, um, and they ha- they had a 1.1 million dollar deficit for that fiscal year, which is a which is less than the previous year when they actually had an orchestra that was playing concerts. They had a six million dollar deficit, uh, which they say is evidence of the fact that their business model is unsustainable, and I think is evidence of the fact that they have no idea what they're doing. Um, but it's it's kind of crazy that they are still paying themselves to do these things, uh, yet not having any concerts. It's it's it reminds me of Joseph Heller and and getting paid not to grow alfalfa. They are they are paying themselves not to have any orchestra. Like they're they're paying yeah. themselves they're handsomely, I would say, not to run an orchestra. Yeah. And and a quick side note, going back to the Grammys, the they're nominated for best orchestral performance Again. under Osmo Vanska. For Sibelius one and four, so which is, is a project that will not be finished now. Recording all of Sibelius symphonies. 
This is the second second year in a row that they've been nominated for a, a recording in this Sibelius Symphony cycle that the orchestra is not playing. And last year, I think it was in like January or February or something, they put together uh, a special concert. They all kind of called a truce for a day to perform these Sibelius symphonies and have a special concert in honor of their Grammy nomination. So I don't think that's going to happen this year. Patrick, you were talking about their concert series that they just, that the musicians announced, right? Yes. Yeah. So without the help of the, of the administration, um, the Minnesota orchestra musicians will put on a 10 concert season um, this coming year. So um, I, I mean, and they raised it, money through they, donations, right? Just, yeah. Just, I mean, it's very it much, much? E- every, Every event is really going to be a fundraiser. I mean, I can, I'd imagine, you know. Well, they've, like been, the they've been talking about filing as their own separate 501c3 and putting together their own system, which is which is great if it'll work. But it's hard to start over. It's hard to start over again. They, yeah. I mean, they they have no endowment. I don't know where they're going to go. But you know, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that, like having the association behind the orchestra, has always supplied is infrastructure. But that's a, a model from days gone by, from a business model of days gone by. And there's lots of free infrastructure, free user friendly infrastructure available for an organization like that. So getting something no, up no, and no, running. No, 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 no. On the you other hand, I, I wouldn't mind people. to have an endowment and a, and a business manager and people handling us <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we didn't have to do all that work you know i, I it, having having a staff of an orchestra allows you to let the musicians be musicians which yeah. is right important there. right <laughs> yeah i don't think i i agree i don't i don't know if you can expect the the you know the violin section of of the orchestra to take over you know making phone calls for the front <laughs> office like you need people think- that do those things <laughs> Well, right. In, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's against the union rules to ask them to do that kind of stuff. Like, what are you going to have to do? Sweep up? The, go for it. Before you interrupted me, I was going to say it's not like they're going to do it all on their own, but it, the possibility exists to sort of reinvent the model, you know, and yeah. make it more sustainable in the environment we actually find ourselves in now. Um, because if, like, we've just been laughing and giggling about if the Minnesota Orchestra Association is running a deficit that big when they've done nothing all year, I mean, <laughs> it seems like it could be done better than that, and there's some dead wood to be chopped off, you know? Well, they're they're <laughs> arguing that they have that uh, that they have that that big deficit for a year that they didn't perform because they didn't bring in as much income as they would because they didn't sell any tickets or get as many donations. But I think it's I mean, I I would think it should be more in a year that they're not playing. I think it's evidence that they don't know how to manage the orchestra when the orchestra is playing, that it's still running a huge deficit when, when the orchestra is playing and an only smaller deficit when they're not playing. I don't, I mean, clearly these guys are idiots and there's no fix, there's no fix and stupid. Um Sometimes. And it's an orchestra that has been uh, dedicated to new works too, so... In whatever form, we, we all hope they hang on. Yeah, when we talked to Aaron J. Curtis about the the uh, Composer Institute at Minnesota Orchestra that he ran for many years, and now that whole thing is, is totally gone. And hopefully we can start something else up somewhere else. But, you know, that was that had a, they had a great tradition of supporting new music there, and now it's all dead. That's very sad. Yeah. You know what's not sad in the orchestra world? Deborah Rudder. Deborah Rudder. Deborah Rudder is the new president of the Kennedy Center starting next season, which is wonderful. We have talked about the outgoing president of the uh, Kennedy Center before on the show, going you know way, way, way back to for, for longtime Sound Notion listeners and watchers. To I, I, I looked at looked at these. We talked about him on Sound Notion six mm-hmm. and Sound Notion forty five. Um, and he he wrote all kinds of crazy things. He had a column in Huffington Post, or he would write like r- ridiculous things in the Huffington Post about um, there's n- the reason that art is failing is that the art that we're making sucks. It's not any good. Yeah. There's just not. It's not that that nobody wants to support it. It's just that it's not any good because you guys suck at it. Um, <laughs> and that there's that's too a paraphrase. Much to be and he also and too much. 
too much being produced, too much art being produced. Well, you're you're confusing mm-hmm. the president of the Kennedy Center with uh, the chairman of the oh, National I? Endowment of the Arts, Rocco Landisman, uh, who was also crazy. Um, but the, so Rocco. He, yeah, Rocco. But it, Michael <laughs> Kaiser also is super anti new media and complained about just anybody being able to write their own critique of the orchestra on the orchestra website or anything. And he's, this is a quote from his, his column. Many arts institutions even allow their audience members to write their own critiques on the organizational website. This is a scary trend, unquote. He thinks that it is a scary trend that anybody can write anything they want about the orchestra performance on the internet. Uh, so good luck to him. <laughs> <laughs> as he takes a teaching position in arts management at the University of Maryland, go Terrapins. <laughs> and, you know, maybe he can teach, uh, instill his mistrust of technology on a whole new generation of arts managers. He'll be teaching, he'll be teaching cautionary tales 421 in arts management. <laughs> but more importantly, let's talk about Deborah Rudder. Deborah Rudd yeah. is awesome. She, she's coming from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. She'll be the first woman president of the Kennedy Center, which is wonderful. Um, and, you know, she's going to be, a, she's a classical music person. And Kennedy Center has not, is not an exclusively classical music. I mean, from our perspective in classical music, we think of the Kennedy Center and the National Symphony Orchestra and things like that. But there's, they do a lot of other things, there's like over 2,000 or something shows a year, which is bananas. But they they do over 2,000 shows a year, and only a fraction of them are classical music. So hopefully this is an indication that they are interested in giving some more uh, emphasis to that. Um, and, yeah. you know, in Chicago, she did a lot of really cool stuff with the Chicago Symphony, and hopefully she'll be able to do some of these ambitious... Um, you know, reimagining of concert experience and uh, really interesting outreach projects and in- audience engagement projects. Um, and hopefully she'll be able to to get Christoph Eschenbach, who's the uh, music director of the National Symphony, on board with some some really cool new projects. And we'll we'll certainly be watching the Kennedy Center and the National Symphony Orchestra a little more closely. Uh, it's worth mentioning that. You know, uh, seemingly no orchestra these days is immune to having labor problems because of the economy. And so she was at Chicago when they had their strike that lasted all of like a week or whatever and was completely amicable. And yeah, it was it was not the invective hurling uh, in the media name calling BS that a lot of these other label labor disputes have become. And uh, we have to at least assume assume that she's at least. Uh, in part responsible for the smoothness with which that was settled. Yeah. So looking for good things out of her. Don't disappoint us. (laughs) (laughs) Sam, this next one is all you. Well, this, this next story, it's, it's kind of a, a, a company eating its own dog food to, to promote itself. But, um, there is a, I forgot the name of the record label now. Um, hold on one second. I'm not my uh, my tablet died, and that's where I had the uh, the, the link Show open. Notes. <laughs> you, should, you should really yeah. charge your devices, Sam. <laughs> yes, I know. I was using it to watch the West Wing when I went to bed last night, and that's what my problem is. Um, <laughs> it's actually a a company a uh, a closer listen ACL, um, and they uh, it, they call themselves the home to. Uh, lots of music that wouldn't otherwise have a home. And I listened to a, a wide selection of what they call, now I wouldn't say this is classical music necessarily, but I listened to a wide selection of what they call their experimental music, and it is incredibly experimental. I mean, they're, they're not trying to make dance music that, that, that uh, you know, you can snap your fingers to or anything like that. But it's an interesting piece just about um, uh, creative uh, physical media packaging. Um, if you're going to do the physical media thing these days, I think it's cool to do it upright, you know, and have limited runs of some kind of uh, special uh, physical media. Have you guys, uh, uh, Roberta and Patty, have you guys done any kind of uh, groovy uh, physical media packaging for anything? Truffles? Yeah, well, I mean, that was putting them in like a box, but 
<laughs> no, not not really. I mean, these are great though. I mean, I, I think of like yeah. the time and the and the. Well, I think packaging a concert as a dinner is a, is a pretty good physical That's true. Yeah. time intensive, <laughs> right? I was I was thinking yes. too literally. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, well, I think what we did a fundraiser campaign this fall, and for for one of the thank you perks for for people who contributed, we made chocolate truffles and and sent those out. Ah. But but I think well, that's me, the closest we've come. I mean, for yeah. uh, Sam, you kind of touched on this. I think if 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 we want people to care about the physical thing, you have to make it more interesting than just a disc in a jewel case or a disc in a digipack or something like that because i've got too much stuff in my apartment already and i'm really <laughs> frustrated i was looking around for a place to buy we talked about this maria schneider record earlier and i was looking for a place to buy that digitally and you can only buy it from her artist share uh site you can't but you can buy the cd from amazon or wherever but I had a hard time finding a, a, a place that I could buy a digital download of it. Uh, I, it, was, it wasn't on any place that I wanted to, to, to buy it from. Uh, and it yeah. was very frustrating. And I don't care about her CD. I just want the music. And we've talked to, yeah. we've t we talked to um, a couple of guys from So Percussion earlier this year. And they had a, an album release <laughs> of Dan Truman's Neither Anvil Nor Pulley that had a really crazy uh set of options for the release there was um you know the the little speaker element thing that they wanted you to attach to stuff and use the resonance of whatever you could stick this thing to to play back the album mm -hmm. through and they had the uh interactive controller thing and they had the uh repurposed vinyl record thing that they had taped over the 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 tracks that would play back this this rhythm when we, by scratching over the tape and they had a lot of really creative stuff and uh I, I i thought it was was great and i would i would love to see more of that kind of thing even even simpler things that aren't so labor intensive for the artists like they were actually making those things right they were they were physically doing all that stuff themselves but then there's other yeah. stuff like you know this is we talked about this a long time ago this is a uh a recording of michael gordon's timber uh by a percussion ensemble slogvik den hog and it's in this it's it's a piece for you know giant you know two by fours basically and it's in this wooden case thing this is a couple years ago but it's super cool and i i bought it because i wanted the thing and that's I that yeah. like this is this is a thing that's taking up space in my apartment too. But I'm happy for this to take up space in my apartment, right? It's sort of like um, Tristan Parrish's One Bit Symphony. I Boom. think that's the yeah, most yeah. successful example of that, where he has the electronic composition all on a single microchip that's housed in a CD jewel case. Yes, yeah. this, yeah, this is it. Like, if you're watching <laughs> the video, I'm holding up my copy of uh, One Bit Symphony. Um. That takes it a step further, actually, because it's it's not just a, and we had him on the show and we talked about that piece. It's not just that that is a copy of the piece the same way that a CD is a copy of the album. We were talking about how the physical presence of the little device in there makes each sort of version that you buy slightly different based on the physical presence of the thing inside that case actually generating the sound. Right, and he makes that. Which, like, tr which this, is is, cool. this is a handmade thing from the guy, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, isn't every it, the pitch of every of every device of every CD you get is like slightly different, right? Yeah. Of every CD. Yeah. Of every or every, every jewel case of the one. Oh, you're talking case. about every. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that that's probably yeah. true. It's probably affected by temperature and all kinds of things like that too, because it's using a, a crystal oscillator thing, right? Doesn't that won't that affect yeah. the? I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is a problem. We should move on. Like you can't. You can download the MP3. <laughs> yes, you can download a recording of it, but it's not the same. Real quick, there's a lot of, of cool packaging, and I'll have a link in the notes. You can look at. Apparently, cassettes are are popular these days for hipster releases. Uh, <laughs> if you're listening to the audio, you should imagine me rolling my eyes right now. <laughs> yeah. So, but the, the the simultaneous the I, I think this might be eye roll I eye, eye roll inducing for Dave, but I think it's pretty cool because I've actually made this before. Is one uh, I think it's Michelle Van Van Michelle Vandera. 
um, released a piece where the, the, the audio comes on a USB stick that's embedded in a brick of homemade soap. That sounds pretty sweet, actually. <laughs> yeah, and you can now that is an item to have on display in your home, and there's a picture of it on the website, and we'll have a link. Wait, um, but you it have to like from- wash, wa- you like use the soap until the USB stick reveals itself, or <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah, you get I a little, you get a little have- treat at the end. <laughs> I want to have the thing to listen to, but I wouldn't want to like damage my bar of soap. I would want to proudly display it. And it's sort of a translucent, so and it looks like there's something written on the uh, actual memory stick that's in there, so you can you can read through the soap. And it comes. It looks like it comes with a variety. Oh, of, you, you know uh, what? I was reading the wrong name. This is not. This is. I was saying Michelle Vander but you're. I was no. totally wrong. I was going to say I don't know that Michelle Vander piece. This is, this is <laughs> somebody else. He does. He doesn't strike me as a making your own soap kind of distribution guy. No, I was totally wrong. So, you know, that thing I said earlier, ignore it, like most <laughs> things I say. But if that soap yeah. had like a little a, a little like video in it or something like that, then it might be his. Uh, so anyway, a bunch of cool packaging ideas and, and worth taking a look at, especially if you're try- getting ideas for distributing your own physical media. So and if you're going to send me anything... It better be awesome. <laughs> Sam, time is it. The pick of the week. It is indeed time for our pick of the week. That was good, Sam. I like that. That was right. nice. Remember that setting. That's the one you want to keep. Got it. Our pick of the week this week is, of course, as usual, from our guests, uh, Cadillac Moon Ensemble, from uh, the recording that we've been talking about this morning. Um, the piece is... Uh, uh, Sean Allison's Toward the Flame 2008. We're going to listen to uh, the third movement called Atlas. Uh, do you guys have anything you want to say to introduce this before we listen to an excerpt of it? Um, so, th- so this piece is all about moths. So you get um, each movement is about a different moth and this one is the Atlas moth which is the, the really, really huge one. Um, and-, and disgusting. And also awesome. So <laughs> you get to sort of They're like hear... the size of a small bird. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully that comes across a little bit. Excellent. So uh, here is that recording. And that was an excerpt from Sean Allison's Toward the Flame 2008 uh, Movement 3 Atlas performed by uh, our guests, Cadillac Moon Ensemble. That was really great. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Uh, so uh, ex- can you explain um, maybe what you... So this seems to be a very visual thing. You're talking about a big moth and moving toward the flame. Um, is... What, do you think about interpreting that literally while you're playing this? I'm, I always, I'm always very curious about these kind of direct relationships that, that people have between musical sounds and, and things outside music, like this image of this giant moth. 
do you what I'm I'm curious about how you make that connection in your head. Oh, you know what? I can't hear you at all. Oh so no. If you were trying no, I got it now. Okay. It's totally my fault. <laughs> Sorry. Per personally, I was I, I never thought of the mods like going going towards the flame even though that like now that you say it it seems super obvious. I was really just thinking of like the moth like existing like in its own space like I would imagine that a moth of that sort would because I mean like you have this atlas moth that seems like huge and probably really active and probably kicks lots of ass but like <laughs> then and then you have like um there's another movement called death's head where like it, it it's it has a skull on it or something like that and the the music That's itself like the is silence of the lambs um yeah like and it's really subdued so I just kind of instead was thinking of the environment in which I was like I would find this moth, like what the moth would be doing. I I, I didn't think of like what like it, it would be doing in relation to an actual flame, though. I think for me, the beginning of that movement sort of um, the, you sort of hear the flitting in and out very clearly. In yeah. That part. So so once I figured out like the technical tech like the techniques and sounds of it i sort of thought about that in terms of phrasing but. yeah you, you feel the the um the kind of uh it's 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 with the atlas moth in particular it's this really weird combination of this light fluttering feel but also this lumbering hugeness um <laughs> that's it comes it comes across I, I think it's really interesting sam do you have any thoughts uh, well, not about any kind of metaphor or anything, but I know it's a good piece for the pick when, when I'm sitting here listening and when you stop it, Dave, I go, oh, <laughs> so, Sean Allison's I, a pretty I really, amazing composer. You guys should check his other stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. It was very yes. cool. Really enjoyed that. Well, I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us. It was great talking to you this morning. Before you go, do you have any any stuff coming up that you want to plug? We talked about some of these things, but if you know if you have any any shows coming up that you want to plug, or where where can people find you on the web? Um, December twentieth, the Cell Theater in New York. We're playing the Den of Death concert, so we'll be playing all those really weird cat and karaoke and science fiction micro operas we talked about. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm and we're sure on for. Facebook. Yeah, Facebook, stuff. Twitter. Um, our, our our Twitter handle is at Cadillac Moon Ons E N S. <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll post some some for the non local folks. We'll post some things from from Den of Death on the internet for people to see. So just um, visit our website, CadillacMoonEnsemble.com. We have a little blog that explains the pieces in like greater detail, like introduces the composer's perspective. Um, we right. should have talked about the blog today. We ran out of time. Yeah. <laughs> well, visit the blog, CadillacMoonEnsemble.com slash blog. Blog <laughs> awesome. And we will have links to that and, and the Twitter and everything else uh, in our show notes today. If you would like to learn more, anybody listening to this or watching this, if you would like to learn more about um, any of the stories that we talked about, if you want to check out the full list of Grammy nominations, if you want to read any back information about Deborah Rutter and her new appointment at the Kennedy Center, if you want to uh, learn about um, you know rendering your, your own virtual Japanese pop star are. We'll have links to all that stuff uh, on our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash SN. Uh, you can also leave us a comment there. You can also connect with us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. Uh, like us, follow us, subscribe to us. If you have anything that you'd like for us to talk about, our next show is not going to be until after the new year. We're taking the next couple of weeks off uh, for us to, to travel over the holiday. But we'll be back in January. And if you have any stories that you'd like for us to talk about when we come back, you can tweet those with hashtag SNWeekly. And we always take a look at that as we're preparing the show each week. Uh, you could subscribe to this show and all our shows at Sound Notion TV in the iTunes store, so be sure to do that. Uh, if you'd like to support us while you're doing your holiday shopping this year, you can uh, use the Amazon search box on the right side of our site at Sound Notion TV. Uh, and you know, just search for your, your thing through that box, and we'll get a tiny little commission. And uh, it doesn't look anything different to you. It doesn't cost anything different to you. But it helps us out a little bit, and we appreciate that. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thank you again so much for watching or listening this year, and we will see you back in 2014. <laughs>